She was born on May 8th, 2003. She was a cute baby and she had chubby cheeks and... We had two children very close together and we didn't get out at all. So for Carrie's birthday one year, she loves Loretta Lynn. That's her favorite singer. So Loretta Lynn was playing a concert in Muskogee, Oklahoma. It was the first time we ever had a night out since we had kids. Nine months later, we had Cordelia. So I blame Loretta Lynn for Cordelia's birth. <laughs> I faintly remember the day, I know I was with my older sister, Memory, and we were, we were taking a nap in my parents' room, and then they drug us out and they were like, hey, you got a new baby sister and that's the only thing I remember. <laughs> I was like three, so anything new was exciting. I was five, so I don't really remember a lot, but I'm sure I was excited to have a sister instead of a brother, but. <laughs> she was just beautiful. Little chubby cheeks and beautiful, and I, I did not like what they named her. They named her Cordelia, and I thought, that is an old person's name, but Cordelia is who she is. That name suits her so well, but she was beautiful when she was born and always has been. Memory was you know, she was the oldest and she would carry her around like she was a baby doll and everything. And but Cordelia was the one that was never afraid to do anything. Even once she started walking, that led us to being extremely fearful <laughs> for what she would do. She cried a lot though. I don't think I've ever met a baby cry more in my life. She always wanted to try things. We lived outside of Shawnee, and so we had open yard and everything for them to roam. And she went after whatever, even at three years old, whatever she wanted. It was full force all the time. There would be times where she would just go out and she's gone. She would climb up a pole and then she couldn't climb back down. It was like a cat in a tree. So we'd just come around the corner and there she is hanging on to something. We'd have to get her down. Whenever she was like, three or four, she swallowed a penny. And we had to take her to the hospital. We were up all night. Carrie called and told us that she was there. So I went in and she had, she was all in yellow in her sleeping. She looked like a banana. I said, Cordelia, you look like a yellow banana. And they, um, they put her to sleep to take the penny out. When she woke up, she cried for me. Something that I've never told anyone before, especially my parents, I made her swallow it. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, mom, dad, if you're watching, sorry. <laughs> she was friends with everybody since she made friends so easily. She had her best friends, but like, then she had lots and lots of friends. We spent literally every second together during summer, swimming in her pool or going to vacation Bible school together. I had my very first sleepover at her house, like when I was four. We were always at either my house or the Sloan's house, and we just played outside in like her playground and the trampoline. So we would watch like cartoons, and she made friends everywhere she went. The first time we met was at cheer camp in sixth grade, and I remember her specifically because she was so dramatic. We had like a dance competition, and she she won. She was that entertaining. And then the week after, uh, we were at VBS, and I look over and I'm like, hey, were you at cheer camp? And she was like, yeah, this is my friend Audrey, and this is my friend Hannah, and starts like introducing me to everybody. And then just ever since that moment, like I knew that like we were best friends. Our house was the house that everybody came to, and Cordelia was the focal point uh, of all of those friends that came by. They were very deep, very strong, friendships. I don't think I ever saw her relax unless we were just doing movie nights and then we would try and start like seven different movies and I don't think we ever finished one and then we had to go bake something like it was always had to be moving with her but it was a blast I slept good after hanging out with her and every fourth of July we would have all our friends come over and the kids friends and we'd have a big uh, fireworks show and hamburgers and all of that and that girl with the sparklers we lit like two full boxes that was her favorite Cordelia would call me from school at North Rock Creek and say grandma can you bring me lunch at such, such an out tacos or whatever and I would always go out there, but before I got the order, she would always say, uh, oh, can you get four or five more because my friends are hungry. But she always took care of her friends, no matter what.
When we were in Oklahoma, I remember one year it like snowed a lot and me and Kaylin and I think Cordelia was a little bit littler but she helped too and we just made the biggest snowman like it was heavy we couldn't even pick it up like it was a lot of work but we had fun and we just played in the snow that day. We have memory and Cordelia could be the best of friends in the world or you know get her away from me. I, I'm a teenager now I don't need my young sister hanging around. We shared a room a lot so living with her was lots of fun and you know it was a small house, so we were like really on top of each other. We fought so much about clothes, and she would take my clothes, and I couldn't find them when I wanted to wear them. As a parent from a distance, it was extremely entertaining to watch. She, because she got on memory's nerves like nobody's business. She was extremely proud of Kaylin. Uh, Kaylin, being the brother, had a little bit better relationship with her. He didn't mind so much her hanging around. Me and her really started connecting whenever we moved to Texas. I mean, that's because back in Oklahoma, like all, like each of our siblings, we all had different friend groups and all that. And whenever we moved down here, we didn't have anybody, so we just really blended together. Uh, I remember the the first day that we moved here, uh, uh, my dad he gave me and Cordelia twenty dollars, and he said, "Go find friends." And we we're like, what, what does that mean? Like, we can't do that. Um, and yeah, we just went. To, we just went driving around, and we went to uh, the Dairy Queen, but we didn't. We didn't meet anyone. So. I was worried about moving the family to Texas, and Cordy was the one that I was worried most about. She was in the eighth grade, uh, and I knew from my experience of being an Army brat, being the new kid's not always fun. Well, we were worried about Cordelia for about two weeks. In that two-week period, she had about 20 best friends. Kids started coming to the house, and she was a magnet for people. And what we learned later was she was a conduit for people meeting other people. People who had lived in McGregor their whole life became friends because they met Cordelia. She was in the eighth grade, so she was about uh, 12 going into 13 when we moved. She took to Texas like no kid I've ever seen. I think I remember her coming back from her first day at McGregor and she was already like, I want to go hang out with this person, I want to go hang out with this person. So like immediately, she already had people that she wanted to be around and hang out with. She called me from school when she first started. Um, and I didn't realize how special our relationship was. But she called me from the school uh, when they first moved there. And she, it was lunchtime. There was a lot of noise, a lot of kids were around. And she, it was FaceTiming me, and um, it was noisy. And she said, would you all be quiet? I'm trying to talk to my grandma. And I thought, oh my gosh, how does she get by with that? <laughs> but every, every friend she, I think she ever had, when she was with them, she would FaceTime them and introduce her grandma to them. And it has always been my, my most favorite thing with Cordelia, that she must have been proud of me because she introduced me to her friends. We get here to McGregor, and she comes home one day, and you know, she's got all these sports that she could try. There's volleyball, there's tennis, there's golf, you know. And I'm thinking she's going to pick one of the traditional sports. No, she picked weightlifting. She wasn't good in her weight class, but if she could have dropped five pounds, she would have been one of the top freshmen in that lower weight class. We talked about it quite a bit, and she went on diet after diet after diet, but the diets lasted maybe 30 minutes, maybe an hour. Uh, she couldn't walk by Hot Cheetos without grabbing a bag. She did powerlifting. I didn't even know powerlifting was a sport, and we were going to powerlifting meets, and I'm like, what is this? But she was all into that. No one else in the family loves lifting weights as much as she does. She just lifted weights all day, every day. We even got her a bench press one Christmas. That's what she wanted. I think she did track, and I don't even know about like the clubs that she was in, but it seemed like every other day we were going to some kind of event for Cordelia, and I'm like, well, I don't even know what it is. I'll just, I'll just go and support and see what it is when I get there, I guess. She was manager of volleyball manager of baseball, manager of basketball. I said, Cordelia, why are you continuing doing these things, uh, being manager and everything? He's, she's like, Mom, I'm good at it. And when she was a cheerleader, 
she was very loud. They had these megaphones that they would sometimes use. She did not have to use one. You could just hear her, her laugh and her loudness. If she wanted something, she just wouldn't stop until she got it, no matter what it was. She tried to do everything. And she tried to be good at everything too. It's not like she was just doing it for fun. Like she wanted to be good at it. Very competitive on everything in life. Not only soccer, cheer, uh, academics. She was just into everything and wanted to be the best of it. Wanted to be the best whatever it was. She tried to do everything her brother and sister did. So they wanted to play soccer, she wanted to play soccer. Uh, they wanted, you know, they played basketball, she wanted to play basketball. She really compared herself to them. Gymnastics was the one area and the tumbling was the one area that her personality really came out. Everything else was almost a competition uh, with her older brother and sister. Uh, but again, she never lost that fearlessness. Uh, even though she wasn't in gymnastics anymore, she still wanted to be a cheerleader, so she was still in tumbling, things like that. So she asked my dad to build her an, an even bar out on our land. So he did, and she was on that thing all the time. Well, one day, it, it's a evening, and we just hear a crash, I mean, just a thud. We didn't really think anything of it. All of a sudden, Cordelia walks in, and she walks into her room, and we go, what's wrong? Because she's holding her, her shoulder down, didn't say a word. Wasn't going to say anything. She was heading to her room. We had to stop her. She I, I fell. She was embarrassed that she had fallen off. Well, she had cracked her collarbone. Didn't say a word. Wasn't going to tell anybody. And had we let her, she might have just went right back on out when she took a couple of time and all and got back on the stupid thing. <laughs> she didn't let failure keep her from going back and, and doing whatever it was she wanted to do, even when she probably should have. <laughs> She loved to volunteer with anything, but she just liked to stay busy all the time. And I wish she would, have slow, she would slow down a little bit, but she didn't want to. She was a pal in school, which is where the upperclassmen go to the uh, junior high and the primary and help meet, mentor kids. So I remember I would be in my classroom every day and then I would see her, she would come in and say hi, and then she would go off with her pal for the day and go do whatever. So she didn't know exactly what she wanted to do with her life going forward, but she knew she wanted to help people. I would always pick her up from whatever event she was at, and I would always embarrass her, doesn't matter what. I would always like scream at her as she was like walking, like if I would drop her off, I'd scream love you bunches, and I guess people started making fun of her for it because people started saying love you bunches just like randomly. Um, so that was pretty cool. Getting to know Cordelia was, it was one of those moments where you were never entirely sure what she was gonna say to you. She was never wrong and you didn't wanna tell her that. But she was very honest, she was up front with you. There was not beating around the bush or trying to lie. It was a, I'll give you an instance. Um, we were at one of the pageants one year and I had on these, these boots. They were super cute and I was like, oh, I'm gonna dress up cute and the girls are all in their gowns. And I made a comment about my feet hurting and she turns and she looks at me and she goes, well, if you'd wear more comfortable shoes, you wouldn't have that problem. And I stood there a minute and I was like, Am I supposed to be upset at this? Or am I kind of proud that like she is just that honest? And she lifts up her dress and underneath her dress, she's got on her Crocs. And she's like, see, comfy shoes. And I was like, I can't, I I'm impressed. I can't be upset at this. Like this is the moment of my life I've been waiting for, for someone to just be like, just be you, like do you. And that's how Cordelia was. And that's how she came across with everything between um, the various parades that they were in, or the interviews that they got to go, or the Doc Anderson that they got to go and meet. That was just her, and it was a, this is who I am, and we're gonna have fun today. We came to McGregor, and it was kind of a big thing. Like, I think she just decided to sign up, and then she decided to keep signing up until she won, you know? I think it was part of that competitive thing. She just wanted to win it, and then she finally did, so that's, it was awesome. I've never done any pageants or anything, so, I've no, I don't know how they work or anything, but I thought she did really good. So the first year that I met Cordelia, she tried out for the Miss McGregor pageant and actually got first runner-up. 
Um, and I want to say she tried out the 2017-2018 year. And she had fun. She did great. But she got through that year and she was like, I can do this. I can really do this. I, I want to do it again next year. I was actually at a conference in Los Angeles for the credit union. And I knew she was competing. And I get a call and she is just so excited she won. She had won Miss Teen McGregor. She was very excited and very proud that she was going to get to represent McGregor. Cordelia did participate in three different parades. She did the Founders Day Parade, she did um, the Christmas Parade here in McGregor, and then she got to do the Waco Wonderland Parade in Waco as well, down Austin Avenue. So she did three different parades. And when you're in a parade and you're wearing a big fancy dress and you have the crown and the sash, you get little girls and little boys who come up to you all the time. They're like, can I get a picture with you? And she loved it, but she loved even more telling them, you can do this too. You want to grow up and you want to be a queen or you want to be a princess, you can do it too. So she always had that admiration for the little kids who were like kind of shy but really wanted a photo. Uh, and she'd stop every time and take a picture with every one of them. Even if it means she was running late, she'd stop and take her picture and be like, okay, I gotta run. And then she'd hike up her dress and her yellow Crocs and she'd take off across the parking lot to get wherever she was going. Uh, in my job at the credit union and in my volunteer work, <clears throat> I do a lot in the community and I, I get my picture in the paper a lot. Usually it's for ribbon cuttings or things like that, but I'm there quite a bit. Well, as she started getting into her volunteer work, she started to do things. Her picture would make it in the paper more and more. So on Wednesday, I would know if my picture was ahead of hers in the paper because she would not call me. But if her picture was ahead of mine, I would get a call to let me know, I'm on the front page, you're on number three. Or I'm on the fifth page, you're not in there at all. It was a, a, a running competition. Uh, and she loved that. And it got to where I would go get the paper if she didn't call. I'd find out if my picture was in and hers wasn't, and I would start calling her. <clears throat> and she would, I can't take calls in school, you have to quit calling me. Even though she would definitely call me if she was ahead. But. Um, she loved competition for competition's sake. She loved to win. No, it was not in her vocabulary. She, she did not, she had to get everything. She wanted everything, which I always thought she was kind of spoiled because of it, but looking back, it was just making life more fun, watching her try and get her way. Just the way that she was so willing to make friends she, you could not know her and go up to her and hang out with her for 30 minutes and all of a sudden you would be best friends with her. She knew like how to talk to people and she'd never like hurt your feelings or anything. I didn't know one person that knew her that didn't think she was their friend. You know, she might not have been like as close to them as she was with other people. That didn't mean like she didn't say hi to them whenever she saw them and she remembered everybody's name better than I did, I know. And like, I have memories of her just walking in like to the mall and whatever, and she knew somebody there and she knew their name and everything, and she never forgot anybody, and they were all her friends. And Nothing in her personality would have screamed cop to me, but that's what she wanted to do. She wanted to go to Tarleton and she wanted to be a cop, which I don't, I don't know where the heck she got being a cop from, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, she wanted to be a cop. Why she wanted to be a cop, I have no idea. I think she wanted to be a police officer because Terry's Uncle Norman was a police officer, and oh my goodness, they were, <laughs> they were very close. I mean, we, he lived in Missouri, so we'd see him at uh, Thanksgiving. They would laugh and joke together and everything, and he was a police officer, so I think that that's why she wanted to be that. Maybe she thought being a police officer, she could just help as many people as she can and just be there for people who need it when they need it, so I think that maybe why she wanted to do that, because I don't know, I couldn't, I couldn't see her doing it, but I'm sure she would have done it. <laughs> I'm sure she would have gotten there and she would have been really good at it, so. She was always appreciative of everything. Everything was funny to her. When she entered the room, she was the whole room. She was just the light of everything. But so many stories about <laughs> how she would be a friend to someone that didn't have a friend. And that's, I think that's another one of my very favorite things about Cordelia, was how she, treated other people. Doesn't matter if it was just 
meeting new people or if it was just walking down the halls. She was like, she was always walking around with a smile on her face, just getting ready to go for the next thing. She was always living in the moment. And if you met her, it doesn't matter if you didn't like her at first or not, she would have found a way to be friends with you. <laughs>
And because I thought that Terry had told her she could stay the night with Natalie and they just decided to come to the house. And I opened the door and uh, it was the highway patrol and I just knew. And I heard screaming in the living room and my initial reaction was, oh, Cordelia just brought her friends over again and they're screaming and I walk out there and there's two cops standing over my mom and she's just crying and uh, the officer he looks at me he's like uh, excuse me excuse me son is uh, your father home I remember my son running into the bedroom waking me up and basically telling me that the cops were downstairs the police were downstairs and I heard my wife crying I run down the stairs and I turn the corner uh, into our living room, and I immediately knew. They were telling me that uh, Cordelia was in a car accident and she didn't make it, and I don't know if I was screaming. I'm sure I was crying. Initially, I was in, I was in shock. I didn't really, I wasn't really crying. Um, the only thing on my mind was, okay, I need to, I need to call. Grandma, Grandpa, let them know. I need to call memory, let her know. Um, and I just need to, I need to tell people uh, to keep busy. So I was already asleep, but it was, it was 12.04 and my brother's calling me. And so I answer it and I can't remember exactly what he said, but it was like Cordelia was in an accident and she didn't make it. And I, I got up and like, I didn't even make it to my door. I was just on the ground, like, crying. <laughs> like, what should I do? What should I do? And he was like, there's nothing you can't do. So I'm, like, yelling at my roommate. I'm, like, screaming. And she comes in there, and she helps me get ready, and we just go to my breaker. And as soon as I got there, I don't know, like, what the time span of this was. It was probably, I know, it was 30 minutes from my apartment to the house. And then I go in, and... My dad was on the stairs crying. Which, I don't see my dad cry, so that was hard. The next thing I remember is our house is full of people. This has gotta be one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. But I remember sitting in my little seat on the stairs because that became my spot. As I said before, I'm not a people person. I don't like to be around people. So I sat in my little spot and I just watched the events unfold around me. Then Kaylin, he called Grandma Papa. And I never realized till now what a difficult call that had to be for him. Um, he talked to Papo first and asked him to go wake up Grandma. And it was, and, and then I didn't think what the drive they had from Oklahoma to here, what that sh must have been for them. Even up until this point, like it wasn't, I, I hadn't cried yet because I was still just like trying to keep busy. Like, just, okay, just keep, keep telling people, keep telling people. And, Finally, after I had turned around from uh, going to pick up my sister, I was just sitting there in my car, and it's right outside my house, and I, that's, that's when I just broke down. The two police officers, they came over, and they hugged me and everything. I, I remember feeling the hand of one of the highway patrolmen on my back. To have a job as hard as theirs was, to have to do this, they were as kind and comforting as they could be. It seemed like the whole high school was there. Like, my house was like jam-packed full of people. And it was just crazy because there were so many people in there, but it was just quiet, like. I mean, we cried and we slept and then uh, waiting for mom and dad to get there. We each allowed ourselves to grieve the way we wanted to, the way we had to in that moment. And I was able fairly quickly to be able to comfort her. 
But in that moment, you have to grieve on your own, unfortunately. I just sat on the stairs and all the high schoolers were in the living room and I think they, you know, they slowly started to trickle out, but like I just sat up with my family all night. Cordelia was out going to see a boy. Uh, what we have found out after is even Cordelia's rebellion is a comfort. She lived her life. She was going to uh, meet this boy that she liked. I didn't know that she was, but that was her plan. And he lived towards Gatesville, but he was at his friend's house, and that's where she was going. Uh, he lived somewhere on uh, 185, Farm to Market 185 or whatever. Um, she was pulling off of that road on 284. So the road that she was turning out of, it was at a bad angle. It was kind of being blocked by a tree and a shed, and it was on top of a hill. And it's at a, probably like a 45 degree angle. Like it's, it's a sharp turn. And I don't know, they said she ran a stop sign, but I don't know, she could have ran a stop sign, but like, it's hard to see there. So she just pulled out coming home and the truck hit her and um, they say that uh, she died instantly, which that gives us more peace. And uh, the guy that hit her, uh, he got out, checked on her. The house is right next to it. They, they called the cops, and they were there incredibly fast. But at the end of the day, she was already gone. We don't blame anybody. It was purely an accident, and we know that it was Cordelia's fault. But it was it was Cordelia being Cordelia. But to see how she looked after the accident, and then look at her car, it was a miracle that she looked so beautiful. I just kept going um, the entire week between her passing and the funeral. I was only alone three times, and each of those three times I just broke down. Immediately following the accident, the grieving process for me was leave me alone. Uh, don't want to talk to anybody, don't want to be around anybody. For my wife, it was the exact opposite. She had to be around people. So I felt it was my duty to be there for Carrie, which meant I had to be there around all those people. So then the next day, um, I think I went down to the funeral home first uh, by myself. Um, they just had her on a gurney, gray blanket on her and everything. So mom had a white, beautiful, soft blanket. So he took it down there and put it on her. It would be hard to get through something like this without having some type of faith, knowing that she's in a better place. And I think another big thing is just knowing how everyone was remembering her and stuff. Like, it was just, it kind of comforted me to know that everyone else is remembering her for how great she is. And, you know, they're really sad about her loss too. Just knowing how many lives she affected and how many people were like really upset about her. Our family is like close. So we went and we picked out everything together. We picked out the casket together. We picked out the music together. I, I was not any good at picking out the service. I think I might have helped pick the casket out, but I don't remember anything. My kids picked the music and there was one song I probably had heard it before, but I really, it was like I had heard it for the first time ever. And it was, uh, I Live. That song summed up Cordelia perfectly. And as I said before, the way I grieve is by myself. And there'll be times over the past couple of years where I wanted to grieve, that I wanted to just break down. And I would play that song. 
I'd queue it up, I'd play it. And I could never get through the song without just completely breaking down. And I don't mean like I'm doing now, you know. I mean completely breaking down where I can't talk, I'm sobbing. And I would play that song over and over and over again. And it would just, it would wreck me. Those memories kind of like resonate with that event. So it's hard to like listen to them and not feel the way that you felt when you were listening to them in that big moment in your life. I didn't go back to work until after the funeral, so I was with my family that whole entire week, and I didn't go back to my apartment either, so I was sleeping on the living room floor <laughs> with my grandparents on the couch, but just being with my family and mourning Cordelia was really all we did that week and planning the funeral, and... I just remember an unbelievable amount of people. If you remember in movies or things like that when they do a time lapse, and you just see people, that's how I felt for at least the next three days. There was a lot of times people just came and told stories about her that we didn't really know. Like, there was a lady who came to interview my parents for the news, and she said that her brother went to McGregor and he was new, and he talked really good about Cordelia because she was the only one who came up to him and tried to be friends with him, so that was a cool story. Just hearing little things like inside that other people had about Cordelia that, you know, we don't get at home. The pouring in of all of her friends, like, I don't even know how the heck they got our address, but they would just show up in droves just constantly. And they would just talk to us and they'd talk about how they met Cordelia and how much of an impact that she had on them. So like the days after, I wanted to be around the people. I needed that contact and everything. And Terry didn't need it. He would go upstairs and have his time uh, by himself to work through it, process through it a little bit. There were two activities through this entire thing that really kind of shaped my life uh, at the time. The first was the sheer amount of media attention that Cordelia got. She was Miss Teen McGregor. She was a local high school hero. She was in the paper. She was in news. And I just kept thinking in my mind, she was telling me, see, I can do this so much better than you can. <laughs> they ran stories about her on the TV. We actually did an interview three days after the event. I didn't think I was going to get through it but we did it for her because we knew eventually we would want to have done it, even though in that moment we didn't want to do it. So, I, and I just kept hearing in, in the back of my head, Cordelia, see, I'm on TV, see, I'm in the paper. Like as soon as Cordelia died, I did not leave my parents' house. Like, I just stayed with them and I moved my stuff back in because it was just, I knew that they needed me and I needed them too, so it was nice to be with family. Pretty sure I was in denial about it. Um, I mean, even, even to this day, I walk into her, her room and expecting her to be there. She's not. For the three years prior to the accident, the credit union was my life. Everything I did was for the credit union. So that was my refuge. So I would go after, at dark, after um, everybody had been in the house all day, I would just kind of sneak out and I would go sit in my office for just a couple hours. I think I might have tried to do some work. I don't know how, how good I did at it. Um, we had a lot going on at the credit union. I would you know, try to leave notes for the employees. They probably didn't make any sense at all. But that was my grieving process. I had to keep going. Because uh, it would have been very easy for me to grab a blanket, go to the hole in the backyard, lay down, and just stop. Matter of fact, that's what I wanted to do. When Terry would grieve, he would need to be by himself. But then, you know, I would reassure him and hug him and tell him, you know, I love you and I'm here if you need me. 
so I would let him grieve that way and then he would let me grieve how I needed to and then sometimes we would come together and talk about how we were feeling and sometimes it was the same and sometimes it wasn't so it was just different sta stages so that's just continued through this process and that may have been what helped us through the grieving process being so different. I know that I was just like in awe of how many people came just to remember her because at her funeral there was like we filled up the exchange center there was probably like seven eight hundred people there like just for her so that just really shows how many people that she touched and that she spent time to form relationships with because they cared enough to you know drive five hours from Oklahoma to come remember her. May 8th was her birthday and I went up the morning and had coffee with her and I just I just laid on her her plot or whatever and cried and cried and cried because I miss her smile and her laugh and her hugs. <laughs> we want her here. We would give anything to have her. And while we lost her way too early, I, I, I think she went out the way she was supposed to. She went 100 miles an hour, and then she stopped. The journey after the event, uh, when you're in the middle of it, you don't think you can go on. I like to read a lot, and there's a, one of my favorite book series, The Wheel of Time, there's a saying, and it is throughout that book, uh, death is light as a feather, duty is heavy as a mountain. So as you start to come out of the event, you start to realize there are people that are counting on you. There are people that depend on what you do. And <laughs> you, just, you can't live in that moment. But the hardest part is you don't want to move on. And you really don't think anybody else should be moving on either. <laughs> there, there's a famous song from the 60s, Why Does the Birds Keep Singing? You know, it, it talks about his breakup, but it, it's the same thing. You think the world should stop. And it should not keep going until you're ready for it to keep going. Problem is, the world doesn't care what you think. Like a week after the accident, I went back to work. So then Terry went back to work. The kids went back to school um, because we just needed to have a little normal, normalcy um, back. Because if we would have stayed at home, we would have stayed in bed and we would have been in the depths of despair. <laughs> well, whenever, whenever she passed away, I definitely knew that like, that was, that was probably the biggest wake up call of my life. So just pretty much every, every day since then, I've just kind of had this reminder in the back of my head that today could be the last day that, you, that you're alive. A few weeks after I think I was, you know, starting to go back to work and trying to get like a normal life. And it was just hard to do normal things. So now I can do it without even thinking about it. Like it's just a normal thing for me. Is it with the support of, of everybody in the community, with the support of my employees, with the support of my job, it was a lot easier than I thought it would be to get back into life. When this event happened, I stepped out of living. The world kept going. Everybody involved knew eventually I would be back. So they kept my place. And that was the most important thing anybody could have done for me and my family. Keep our place. Okay, so I find little signs um, and not everybody will believe in little signs, but when my father passed away, I found pennies. And so I just kind of kissed the penny 
and show it to heaven. Um, so then that carried on to Cordelia. So every time I find a penny, I just kiss it and say, love you, baby. So then everybody, all of her friends and stuff, when they find a penny, they know that it's from Cordelia. And some days I can just be having the roughest day and I have cried and I'll go somewhere and there's a penny. And she's just saying, mom, it's gonna be okay. She's like, I got gotcha. you. You know, this whole thing, it's been two, almost two and a half years. And this whole time, to me, Cordelia was away at college. She was away at a soccer game. She just was not home. She'll be home later. And somehow that just helped me. And if it w didn't help me, which it didn't help a lot of times, I would just call on Jesus and he would take that pain away from me. And just day by day, that's, that's all I can say, second by second, and you do get better. You, it does get better. You realize that she's not coming back. They're not gonna come back. But you have the memories of such a wonderful love that God loaned to you. He just loaned it to you, and thank, so thankful for it. So thankful for Cordelia being my granddaughter. But that event is going to be with us forever. And we don't mind talking about it. We do feel, you know, we can feel someone's discomfort when they first learn about it. But if you want to talk to us about it, we'll love to talk to you about it. We love talking about Cordelia. We love talking about all our kids. Kalen, he's going to go back to OU. Um, he's in California right now doing his National Guard thing. He's going to make sergeant in the reserves. We're all celebrating that. Uh, my oldest daughter graduated from Texas Tech. Memory is going to go to Cabo for a bachelorette party. That'll be the first time she's on an airplane, so she's a little nervous. <laughs> Anya, our youngest child, her personality is really starting to come out. She just hangs out with her friends. <laughs> I think for the first few weeks I lived in denial. Um, and then her funeral happened and I went down to Waco for that. And um, it was very hard to try and live and not think about it. I just find hope in talking about memories I have with her to people around me. Because I get to talk about her. Because trying to tell people about the girl that they should know or should have known is the only way I've kind of coped. <laughs> it definitely gets better. Like, I, when I found out, like, I was like, this is it. Like, this is the end of me. Just, I don't know what to do with myself. Um, but it definitely gets better. And you just have to look for those signs of them watching over you and you'll know. Um, but it does, it does get better. It was hard to, just because she wasn't always here with me, I guess, before she died. It was in those moments where I forgot about her, I definitely, or I, like, I've not that I forgot about her, but I forgot that she had passed. I, it's like, I would remember and it would hurt all over again. But now it's been two years, two and a half years, I guess. And I mean, I live a meaningful life with my friends and seeing my family. So what you have to realize, if you're going through this right now, you're one week, two weeks, three weeks after the event. Mourn. But understand that what you're feeling now is not what you're going to feel a month from now. It's not what you're going to feel six months from now. You're still going to hurt. You're going to wonder why in the world life was able to go on without you. Uh, how can the world keep spinning without your loved one? But nobody has forgotten them. We just pray through things. Terry, he knows the Bible. And then Kaylin, you know, he has his quiet time every day. And when I would call mom with a problem or anything, uh, she would say, okay, Carrie, just pray about it. And so, I mean, I do. I pray constantly and, and I thank God for everything that I have, ha that I have 
even though we only had her 16 years, we had her. And we will see her again. She would cry a little bit, be sad for a minute or two, and then she would go on. And so that's what I've done through the whole process. I cry a little bit, or I cry a lot, but then I move forward because I know that that's what I need to do for me and for my family. I wanted to grieve on my own, and I wanted to get past the event on my own and then come back the way I was before. But that's not gonna happen. Grieve the way you want to grieve, and if it will help you, do it. Don't worry about what anybody else says. I think that has, when I came to the realization that I could grieve in my own way, and that what helps me may not help someone else, but I don't care, it's helping me. If it's three o'clock in the morning, you just need to go, go do it. If you need to go sit alone, go do it. If you need to go to a crowded theater and talk to everybody around you about what happened, you do it. Don't worry about other people's feelings. Worry about your own. Whenever something like this like happens to someone that I know, I kind of tell them, you know, like it won't always feel like this because it does start to feel a little less, like it's not so heavy all the time. But it's okay to like feel the way that you're feeling, even when it doesn't look like the other people are feeling the same way that you're feeling. Like your feelings are absolutely valid and it's okay and it won't always feel like this. It's okay to grieve and everyone grieves differently. And I think in a way I'm still grieving because I mean, I still cry like this in this moment, but then I still have moments where we talk about her and I don't cry. So, you know, but I mean, I'm not grieving in the same way I was when she first died or a year after she died, you know? And some, I think eventually for me, grieving turns into just, you know, living the way that you want to live and remembering all the important things that matter to you more because you remember that that person's gone and it's important that you remember the people you still have and it makes you live a more meaningful life. I really struggled with the idea of what grief was so I had to look it up on the internet of course um, and figuring out those stages and which one you're in that really really helps. Use the good memories to stay in a happier place. Um, I have a lot of pictures of me and Cordelia, and Carrie's Facebook is packed with pictures of us together. So I use those to remember the good times and not dwell on the tragedy. I feel like uh, Terry and I are closer now. Not that we didn't care about each other's feelings before, um, but we feel more about them now. Through our grieving process, we were at different levels all the time and we still are different levels and he really likes to be left alone and I know that and you know I would come and check on him every little bit and I need to be around people but I think that that's changing <laughs> that I want uh, more alone time and that could be him casting off to me or something. We've been trying to celebrate our 25th wedding anniversary for about four years now. Um, everybody knows that 2020 hit the world hard. It just hit us earlier than it hit everybody else. It hit us in January instead of March and April. But when the event happened, the last thing on our mind was taking our 25th wedding anniversary trip. We couldn't even fathom leaving the rest of our family to go off on our own to this big uh, once in a lifetime trip, really. But now we're looking forward to celebrating our life, our 25 years that we've been together, uh, which is actually getting close to 30 now, but. We enjoy each other's company and to be able to take these trips and we'll laugh about things that Cordelia ha has said or what she would say uh, during our trips. And that's what we've learned, it's okay. We can celebrate our life. We, we don't have to feel bad 
that Corday is not here. We would give anything for her to be here. But if she can't, it's okay to live your life. And I think that's the hurdle that everybody has to get over. And I don't know when you get over it. I, I can't point to a spot and go, that happened, I'm bad here, I'm good here. With Cordelia, it was the, the length of time has helped tremendously. It's not gone yet. I don't think it ever will be gone. I know I'll get better, but uh, I am better with Cordelia because the days passed, the memories became more important to me. Pictures have helped so much. Thank goodness Carrie takes pictures all the time. And uh, that helps so much. And just the memories, I think, when I start missing her, just think of the wonderful memories that we've had and the things that she's done for the family, the things that she was such a big part of this family. Cordelia was definitely a very happy person. And I, I think that it would be an amazing testament to her if the legacy that she left here on Earth is one of pure happiness. Whenever you think of her name, you just can't help but smile just because of what she's left here on the Earth. Whether she's impacted you or not, it's just, with all the, with all the stories that are out there, like, I don't know how you can't help but smile whenever you hear her name. It just takes getting used to the fact that they are in heaven, that they're not physically with us, but that we will be with them again. I think it just takes time. Like, in the beginning, I was just obviously upset and everything, and I was kind of mad at myself. Like, it wasn't my fault, but I'm the oldest, so I probably should have tried to do something or, but then as time goes on, like, you don't accept it, but it just gets easier to deal with, and it's not so heavy. You just like learn to live with it a little bit. The further away we get from the event, that time truly does heal all wounds. It doesn't take them away. It smooths the edges so that you can continue to live your life. And what was important to us before is becoming important again. And just enjoy life because really that's what Cordelia would want us to do because that's what she did. She lived her life to the fullest and so we're, I guess we're just trying to continue to live our life to the fullest. <laughs> I'm not anywhere near where I was before, but I'm so much further than after it happened. So if you are going through this situation right now, it will get better and there are a million people in the world that want to support you.